Hello, welcome back to this week's episode of Close by Mo. My name is Mohammed. I'm hopefully one of your favorite YouTube hosts on most things real estate. I'm also a real estate investor, broker, and now property manager in New York City. And in this week's episode, we're going to talk about probably one of my favorite contingencies when it comes to making, breaking, negotiating offers. And that is what we call post possession in real estate. This is something that I've seen happen quite a lot, especially in residential real estate. So if you are in the market for buying a property or buying specifically a single family home, or you're in the market for selling your property, this is definitely something that you should consider, especially when it comes to figuring out what term do the offer might make most sense. Because again, I, I've said this again in a lot of my other videos, you know, the, the price may sound like the most important thing, but it doesn't always have to be the most important thing. Without further ado, let's jump right into exactly what post-possession is in real estate. Now, to start us off clearly in terms of defining what post-possession is, I think the name pretty much gave it away, right? Post-possession is basically a term given to when a um, seller sells a property but still remains in the property for a specific amount of time after the closing period. Now, you might be wondering, when does this happen? Why does this occur? Think about it this way, right? Let's say if you as a buyer have to close by June 1st, doesn't matter what else happens in the world, the bank says, hey, your rate lock is expiring on June 1st and you definitely have to buy something by then um, and you don't wanna pay for a rate lock or maybe even for tax purposes, you have to show the IRS that you've closed on a property by a specific date and your closing date is inflexible, but that closing date does not work for the seller in terms of when the seller can move out by or maybe even when the seller is closing on their own property that they're gonna be moving into next, which might be at a later closing date. That gap, that little delta between when you need to close and when the seller is able to move out is it basically what the post possession is for. Meaning in this particular instance, you're still able to close and give the seller post possession, meaning they're gonna be uh, living in the property even after you as the buyer own it. Now there's a couple of different, I would say dynamics when it comes to post possession. From the buyer's perspective, you might be wondering, well, hey, why do I, you know, why would I buy a house and then let the old the owner, the seller, uh, live in the property for a while. Well, there's a couple of advantages, disadvantages. I mean, there's different ways to like look at it, right? Obviously, the, um, the, the main key factor is usually when I see this happen is when the buyer wants to get an edge over all the other offers that might be they might be competing with because for a seller especially if they're getting a lot of offers that are very similar in terms of pricing if they see a buyer doesn't really need to sell out sell their house or uh, you know need to move out of their current property to be able to move into this property and they see that the buyer has, the buyer has offered post possession that's basically more flexibility for the seller right from the buyer's perspective as well, you might have, again, a rate lock that you definitely need to close by because you know market interest rates have risen or maybe there's something unfavorable if you were to not close by a specific timeline. Now, from the seller's perspective, the advantage here is that, hey, you get to still live in the house that you may have sold already while still collecting the funds that you obviously would have. The disadvantage here now is that, you know, instead of just paying a mortgage or maybe if you had owned that house outright and you weren't paying anything, you are more, most likely going to be paying a certain amount of rent or fees to the buyer because, ergo, remember, this is the... Uh, the buyer's property now it's now no longer yours so I, those are i would say the dynamics of like post possession because obviously it will definitely make an offer stronger because it's giving more flexibility to the buyer and the seller but the disadvantage for the seller is that of course they're going to get all the money up front but they're going to have to be paying a rent amount for a certain amount of time until they're able to fully vacate the property now there's a couple of considerations that i tell all my buyers and all my sellers about this uh, you have to make sure that you're getting everything in writing with the attorneys that are involved. Get everything in writing, especially if you're a buyer and you're buying a house for the very first time. Post-possession basically means you're going to become a landlord. There's no other way to describe it. You're going to become a landlord and you're likely going to be collecting a certain amount of rent. That tenant is your responsibility. Uh, who's to say that the seller decides, hey, you know what, I got my money. I'm just not going to stop. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop paying rent now. Uh, that might happen. That's something your attorney will definitely go over with you and that is a risk that's baked into the entire post-possession process. That's why we typically ask for higher than market rent when it comes to offering post-possessions. Um, other things that you should definitely keep in mind is like insurance coverage. Make sure that uh, your insurance company knows what you're doing. Make sure that the homeowner's insurance that you're going to be getting definitely allows something like this or might in the interim give you like some type of landlord insurance. And then for the seller side, you, also, you know, definitely want to make sure you have some type of uh, different insurance policy, typically renter's, home, uh, renter's insurance policy, which is going to be a lot cheaper than a homeowner's insurance. Um, now, uh, a couple of other things to also you know, definitely keep in mind, like, uh, you know, effectively the seller is or the property owner is becoming the tenant. So it's OK for a buyer to charge them rent as well as a security deposit. Those are things that you should expect as a buyer to charge and the seller should expect to be able to pay, especially if they're agreeing on the deal with the post possession clause in there. Uh, a few other benefits and risk, obviously, like I've already mentioned. 
it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of an advantage for both the buyer and the seller because it might be something the buyer is okay with because they don't necessarily have to close right away and that might even give them the edge over a lot of the other offers that the seller is getting from the seller side hey they have a lot of flexibility now right let's say they were waiting to close on another house or they needed a few more weeks because their kids were in school whatever it is and they don't want to leave the house just yet that gives them a lot of flexibility if not a few weeks at least a few months to be able to get their affairs in order and of course the risks that are associated with it right as the buyer you're now not just becoming a property owner you're becoming a landlord and as the seller you're not a property owner anymore you're a tenant so you have to pay a rent security deposit whatever it is that the buyer that the buyer's attorney or the buyer themselves would like to with that guys i hope you guys enjoyed this really quick and sweet uh, video on post possession i hope it was very clear because it is one of those clauses that i like to include in my offers especially when i know that i'm going up against a lot of different um, different buyers out there I'll let you guys go. I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye now.